Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so a couple of just disclaimers. Uh, um, I am not a rocket surgeon or a space engineer or anything like that. Uh, I, for about the past six months, I've been uh, kind of taking a deep dive and looking at the cybersecurity ramifications in space, the application of cybersecurity in space and stuff. Uh, primarily from an offensive security perspective. And so uh, that's the the focus that I'm coming from uh, today. Uh, so if you actually work in the aerospace in the industry or something like that, um, and uh, you know, you might, this might be a little simplistic um, and, and scaling it down and getting to the basic levels. But what I want to try to do is introduce uh, some of the issues, some of the history uh, of cybersecurity in space and kind of what we can do moving forward as an industry to be more present in the space sector. Um, but to start, uh, we're going to start in the past uh, to understand uh, where we're at now and where we're going. We have to go back uh, kind of to the beginning. We're not going to go all the way back to ancient Greece, uh, as some things like to do, but we are going to start um, at really what the genesis of the space race as we know it uh, historically was. Uh, and that was uh, going to be October 4th, 1957. For those of you that are historian buffs, you will know that this is the day that the former Soviet Union, the USSR, uh, launched Sputnik 1 into orbit. Um, this was a monumental uh, accomplishment from science. Uh, from a political standpoint, it created a lot of unrest and uneasiness as this was uh, going on during the, the Cold War. Um, one of my favorite kind of guilty pleasure movies uh, for a lot of reasons is October Sky about Homer Hickam uh, and the Rocket Boys out of McDowell County, West Virginia. Uh, there's a scene in that movie where uh, they supposedly are seeing Sputnik, uh, Sputnik fly over listening to the beacons on the radio. And uh, one of the older gentlemen in the scene goes, they're going to drop a bomb on us. And then one of the uh, uh, main actors goes, would be a waste of a perfectly good bomb, uh, which was kind of kind of ironic. But uh, it definitely created a lot of tensions uh, within the United States, especially, uh, as I said, from a political standpoint. But from a scientific standpoint, it, Sputnik was absolutely uh, just this monumental occasion. Unfortunately, the, the former Soviet Union did beat uh, the United States into space with an artificial satellite, uh, not just once but they actually uh, fired the second shot in the space for what we call the space race with Sputnik 2 uh, in November, um, just just like 20, 29, 30 days later. Uh, in 1957, they launched Sputnik 2. Um, this was the uh, famous launch that included the uh, a dog um, uh, that was launched into, it was the first biological um, payload that was uh, sent into orbit. It wasn't until later in 1958, uh, January 31st or February 1st, depending on your source uh, that you want to reference. Uh, the, it was approximately 1150 something uh, Eastern Standard Time when the United States entered the space race with Explorer 1. <coughs> And uh, later in 1958, we actually had the uh, formulation of NASA in July uh, 20, 29th, 1958. Um, and in a mere 11 years from Sputnik to uh, 19, uh, 1969, July 16th, we landed a man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, and the United States firmly planted the stars and bars on, within the lunar regolith and from my perspective, claimed victory in what was the space race at that point in time. A lot transpired uh, over the, the the coming decades and stuff like that. A couple of notable things that are really interesting and some that have been in the news more recently. Uh, Voyager 2 was launched in uh, August 20th, 1977. It uh, Voyager 2 actually launched prior to Voyager 1, uh, which launched a few days later in September 5th, 1977. Uh, the reason that the for the uh, inverse launches is because Voyager 1 was on a shorter trajectory uh, to its uh, destination and therefore it didn't need to launch as soon. Uh, moving a little bit uh, further in the timeline, we have the space shuttle uh, program was created by NASA with the official launch on April 12th, 1981. Um, but at all of this uh point in time in history stuff. These are significant milestones uh, in both uh, space uh, aviation and exploration, um, but also, you know, milestones within the United States space program and stuff. But the real problem here is that these are very much scientific uh, minded uh, explorations and things like that. Uh, starting even back with Sputnik 1, it was a very, very 
crewed spacecraft. Um, it had uh, zero propulsion capability. It basically had two transponders operating approximately 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz. It was just beaconing out, which could be uh, heard by ham radio operators all over the world. Not very intelligent, not very sophisticated. Um, when, you know, if you look at fast forward to like the moon landing, there's all, you always hear the saying is like the, we put a person on the moon with less technology than in our phone today. Um, those systems that were uh, used from a technology standpoint were very cutting edge, but they don't really com compare to anything that we have today. Um, and so security, cybersecurity thing really just, it doesn't really come into the space scene for a couple of more decades. Um, and, and so we're going to look at some of this. It's really the late 1990s and uh, early 2000s where we start to see uh, kind of this uh, coalescence of, of space and cybersecurity. And we start to say, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it, um, frankly, is just security through obscurity. The technology was extremely expensive. The uh, ability to acquire the hardware uh, to be able to interact with satellites and, and uh, spacecraft and things like that were just very limited. Um, and so it was, wasn't so much a um a forethought is like hey we have to actually be concerned about uh you know potential attacks and stuff like that but as technology improved as the ability to um acquire technology uh improved and it, the cost it was driven down things started to change um pretty rapidly um one of the 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 earliest uh, kind of attacks on satellites that that I've looked at a little bit was really dates back to the uh, early 2009, and it was a Brazilian um, uh, a group of uh, Brazilian hackers actually commandeered a U.S. naval satellite uh, um, uh, FLT Sat eight, I believe is what it was, um, and they were essentially broadcasting uh, pirate radio effectively. Um, also, if you look in uh, 2010, um, many people don't aren't aware of this, but uh, Stuxnet, uh, which was the uh, joint NSA uh, Israeli intelligence um, uh, malware that was developed to target the Newtons. Uh, um, uh, nuclear facility in Iran uh, actually is credited with uh, disabling a Indian television uh, station satellite. It's believed that it was deployed uh, via China. There's some speculation and stuff that, but we do have uh, enough evidence to support that this was actually the first successful malware attack in space. Um, more recently, very recently, uh, and we'll get into this one a little bit more is uh, at the eve of the Ukrainian conflict in uh, last year, um, uh, Viasat had a, uh, a satellite that was compromised. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into, into that here in a minute. Um, but also looking at some just interesting um, things from a historical standpoint and, and why this stuff kind of matters. In uh, very, very recent history, uh, Russia uh, attempted to land a lunar module uh, our lunar lander uh, on the moon again for the first time since 1967. It was uh, the project was called Luna 25. Uh, it failed, um, and it failed uh, due to a couple of reasons. But fundamentally, it was a software bug that uh, resulted in uh, the descent engines uh, burning for 127 seconds when it was originally pro, uh, intended for it to be 84 seconds uh, of a burn. Um, we're going to look at some of the software kind of issue things that because um, hardware is hard in space. There's a lot of constraints and a lot of things like that. But fundamentally, software flaws um, end up being more detrimental um, to spacecraft and their missions a lot of times. Uh, one interesting one that I found, and it just it, it kind of cracks me up a little bit, is actually dealing with Phobos-1, uh, which was a Soviet space probe that was to go uh, and explore Mars and its moons, Phobos and Dimios. Um, the mission failed, uh, and the reason why that it failed was because uh, a satellite operator in uh, late August, I think, 1987, uh, sorry, 88, um, uh, was sent a command to the system. Uh, that command was then supposed to go through a secondary computer system for sanity checking, making sure that everything looked good and all, but reportedly that system was malfunctioning that day, so the operator just bypassed it. 
Uh, I know we, we've never had users bypass security controls in any of our organizations and stuff. It's shocking, but it happened. And what ultimately uh, the result was there was an inadvertent hyphen uh, included at the, or, uh, appended at the end of the command, which just happened to signal end of mission. Uh, so the command was uh, sent bypassing the control and the space probe went, all right, I'm done. I'm out. And that was it. Um, and so user behavior, uh, things like that, like this is this is uh, something that we, you know, it, it happens in space too. It's not just limited to, to our organizations and things like that. <clears throat> but if you've been paying attention, um, you're going to, you've probably seen more and more and more um, information and, and just stories and articles and stuff about satellites and satellite hacking and and warnings about uh, from CISA and the FBI and everything else. Um, and if like if you just do a quick search, this is just some of the information that you're going to see. Um, a lot of these are from this year, uh, July timeframe. There's it's there's a very specific reason for that timeline. And we'll kind of get into that in a little bit as well. But the the uh, agencies all over the world, organizations all over the world, um, and corporations and things like that is they're starting to really, really focus on cybersecurity because a lot of our um, uh, infrastructure and ecosystem is very much dependent on satellite communications. Um, I had a chance to do a, a, a keynote presentation at B side St. Louis just a few weeks ago. And I asked the question, like, how many of you guys navigated here uh, using GPS? Um, because we are very much relying on GPS. We, you know, most most people my age and younger, uh, I, I turned 36 today. So if you're under that, uh, don't know how to read a paper map, um, much less, you know, uh, be able to navigate with a compass or something like that. So we, our entire lives are very much dependent on these satellite communications. Um, and there's some profound implications that uh, if they go down or if there's an attacks and things like that. So that kind of brings us up to um, kind of the present, uh, where we're at today uh, to really understand um, some of the, the threats, the risk, and the vulnerabilities. We do have to do a little bit of a primer on um, just what is space, what is space craft, space systems, and stuff like that. So hopefully it won't be too painful uh, for you guys and you'll learn something, but uh, we're going to start off with a space system. So uh, a space system is typically what we're going to talk about uh, in terms of the, the, the an overall program and, and things. It's going to be comprised of uh, typically three segments. You can have the space segment, which is fairly obvious. That's the, the part in space. Uh, it's typically comprised of one or more spacecraft. Um, uh, and then you're also going to have your ground segment. This is going to be your ground station, your control software, uh, your uh, op your satellite operators, uh, the, the the people processes and, and procedures that actually facilitate communications. Um, and then in some cases, you're going to have uh, applications, you'll have a user segment. The perfect example for this would be something like Starlink. Um, if you're a Starlink customer and stuff, you, you'll, under you'll understand this, that um, yeah, your satellite, your internet is being uh, effectively relayed from Star uh, from the Starlink constellation down to you. You're on the user segment. You don't have, ideally, hopefully, not uh, the ability to control or uh, interact with the spacecraft in any capacity whatsoever. Ideally, and so, uh, jump cover. All right, so this is a uh, gross oversimplification. We're going to use some some terms here uh, just to kind of get you up up to speed on kind of the very very basics of how a satellite uh, kind of operates, what it's comprised of, uh, all of its sub subsystems and stuff. Uh, aerospace people, if you're online, I apologize, uh, but. Um, we're going to start with the top ADCS. This is not Active Directory Certificate Services. I am sorry, Red Teamers. Um, although I guess there's nothing actually stopping us from running ADCS on a satellite. I wouldn't recommend it, uh, but it's possible. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about Attitude Determination Control System. This is going to be, uh, depending on the classification of your satellite, the size of your satellite and things like that, this could be something as such as uh, thrusters. Um, uh, magnet torquers, uh, reaction control wheels, um, as, as well as so basically think of it as any kind of propulsion system or being able to orient yourself uh, relative to, to a point in space, whether it be the sun, the earth, stars, or anything like that. This is, I need to move the satellite 
this is how we do it. You're also going to have a payload section. And this is pretty much the, it's going to depend on your mission parameters, what you're trying to do. Um, it could be, you know, for instance, if you're at a GPS satellite or something like that, providing GPS positioning data and stuff, that's all of the, the necessary equipment for pro providing that user segment, the, the appropriate data is going to exist within the payload section. And this is going to be very, very dependent, uh, as I said, on the actual specific uh, mission parameters, uh, things is your orbits and, and just a lot of other uh, aspects. The electrical power system, the EPS, uh, you have to have power. Um, and we'll talk about some, some of the constraints here. But in my opinion, the EPS uh, is the most uh, important subsystem on any spacecraft because there are limitations of how much power, chemical power, like a lithium ion batteries or uh, nickel metal hydride or, or pick some other kind of chemical based power source that you can take into orbit uh, based off of uh, who your launch provider is and, and things like that. And you have to rely on solar capabilities to be able to recharge um, and uh, maintain operational state. If, if from an attack perspective, uh, if you have the ability to influence the EPS and essentially cause it to the system to use more power than it's capable of uh, generating uh, within a given orbit or a given time frame, uh, you're pretty much going to win. Uh, moving down the uh, CDHS, the command data handling system, this is the brains of the system. Uh, it's typically comprised of an onboard computer or two. Um, it could be uh, something as simple as a Raspberry Pi, which we'll talk about uh, as well a little bit, because yes, those have flown in space successfully. Um, something as complicated as uh, potentially full uh, like Intel x86 hardware, uh, FPGAs, things like that. But this is pretty much where uh, all of the, the brains are happening and uh, your flight software and things like that. And then you also have your communications subsystem. This is typically going to be comprised of one or more radio systems. It could be also uh, a combination of RF and optical, um, as NASA has done some, uh, some trials recently with laser-based communications and things like that. The general kind of flow of PowerPoint just locked up uh, of communications is going to look something kind of similar like that. You're going to have, you're going to have a ground station uh, that is going to send uh, information up. It's going to be received by the communication subsystem, and then it's going to be passed off to uh, the CDHS for uh, being able to actually process, uh, understand what the, what the, the information is, whether it's a command um, or something like that, uh, that it needs to perform. And then it will do its processing and then send that data back to the comm subsystem where it gets sent back to the ground station. That's pretty basic uh, and probably a gross uh, simplification of a lot of things, but I think it's something that we can kind of wrap our heads around and understand. Um, a little more complex uh, of a scenario is is where you have a user segment. We'll use Starlink for an example for this, where you have ground control that's actually managing the operation of the satellite, um, uh, but you also have the payload that is being sent to the user. In this case, it's uh, going to be internet uh, connectivity or something like this. You could, you know, if you want to think of satellite radio or G GPS or Starlink or uh, pretty much anything, uh, sat phones would also be uh, something um, that you that would follow this kind of mechanism and stuff. But um, this is all well and good. We hopefully we have a basic understanding of. Uh, how some of the communications work and and whether this is a, a you know a satellite or the international space station or even uh, like a, a spacecraft uh, such as a dragon capsule and stuff the the the, the premise is the same um, the, the 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 platform um, is going to pretty much function the, the same way there are going to be different uh, constraints and things that are going to take place but looking at it from a, a more generic standpoint this is what we're going to be talking about now. As I mentioned, uh, I've been working and kind of researching this stuff for about the past six months pretty heavily. It's also included a lot of actual development. Uh, I'm the type of person that I like to go hands-on. And so one of the first things that I did uh, in researching this is like, can I build a satellite? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, and but uh, I, I went down this path, and and if you had a chance to go to Wild West Hacking Fest, I hope you did check out the uh, CubeSat lab that we had. 
um there it was it was awesome to be able to to develop that and put on and had a, got a lot of great feedback from that um but i learned so much about constraints um in our cybersecurity world business where if we put that hat on we primarily have three constraints it is going to be uh budget you know money resources and time do I have enough people? Do I have enough money? And do I have uh, all of the necessary stuff to do it? Like that pretty much defines everything in the business world. It defines every cybersecurity project in the world. It's like, well, yeah, we could go and implement that, but it's going to cost us this mo- this amount of money, this amount of time. We don't have the people to do it. These are this is the the life of you know just uh, bolting on security, uh, if you will, within organizations. Um, the constraints in space are that on steroids with so much other stuff that I had never considered. I'd made a lot of assumptions about uh, operating in space. That's like, oh yeah, like it's going to be secure by default and we're going to use encryption everywhere. And that's just not the case. And the answers as to why that's not the case um, are much more um, am humble, in my opinion, um, than just you know technical uh, controls or anything like that. So we'll go through some of some of the constraints that um, a space system, specifically in the space segment, has to deal with. Um, the first one's going to be technical uh, constraints. This can be size and mass. Um, you know, you if your launch provider um, may uh, only be have a capacity of you know fifteen hundred kilograms. Well, if your satellite weighs 1600 kilograms you're not getting off the ground uh power constraints this is in my opinion this is the absolute biggest technical constraint uh, as i mentioned earlier because you rely on solar and uh, uh batteries in most cases there are you know the potential for uh nuclear um mm-hmm. propulsion or no, nuclear batteries and stuff like that but looking at it from a general perspective your power budget is the most important thing because when you look at, uh, for for example, um, in the the CubeSats that I built for for Wawa's Hacking Fest, uh, I really didn't have to uh, run up against the power constraints too much because I could just plug them into the power source. But in the entire development process, I was very cognizant of how much power I was using and when I was using power. For instance, um, if I was transmitting data. Uh, to the ground station, it was using approximately 134 milliamps of power. Um, But the receive uh, process on the the radio module they had only used about 34 milliamps of power. Um, So I have to take in these considerations like, hey, how much can I afford to transmit? When can I afford to transmit based off of constraints, uh, orbital constraints that we'll get into? Um, and things and it's just a slight it's just a different way of thinking um and the people who do this for a living my hats off to you you guys are incredibly smart incredibly detail oriented um and as cybersecurity professionals we actually can learn a tremendous amount uh from the the way uh, that uh space engineers and and the orbital mechanics people and the physicists and the uh, electrical engineers all of these people working together think uh in in terms of i call it thinking in terms of space um, but there's also economical uh, constraints. Um, most of us don't have endless budgets uh, for our security operations center. And the same thing is going to ha- take place in, in a space uh, system as well. There's just not endless funds. You're going to have to make concessions in certain places. Um, another technical control or constraint that, that is something that I don't necessarily, we don't think about and we don't deal with hardly is thermal considerations. Um, the fact that if you're orbiting uh, the Earth, uh, let's say you're in low Earth orbit, um, you're approximately every 90 to 93 minutes, you're going to be rotating the Earth. Well, half that time, you're going to be spent in complete darkness because you're uh, facing away from the sun. That has power issues because you're no longer generating power. So, uh, your maximum uh, power production is fundamentally cut in half on a per orbit basis. Um, and then also you're going to have massive temperature fluctuations between uh, the, you know, the sun side and the dark side of, of the earth. And so you actually, gonna, in some cases, you may have to cool 
uh, your components or, and then immediately 45 minutes later, be heating them up and managing that and heaters take uh, power and you don't have convection that will in space. And so like just all these little kind of weird things that we, we don't, we just don't operate this way. Um, from an orbital perspective, uh, as, as I said, you know, uh, looking at uh, where, when you're in the dark, when you're in the light, uh, one of the things that as I was building my my CubeSats was like, okay, I have the ability to put six solar panels on these. Um, so I was like doing the math, like here's here's how much power I can produce from them. And then I started actually thinking about it through and going, wait, it's actually not that. Um, because at any given time, uh, only one um, face of the satellite uh, would be facing directly into the sun, um, producing maximum power, and others would be getting some reflections off the Earth's atmosphere, and others would be in complete darkness. So this, you know, you know, let's say for for mine, I had one watt panels, so I got six watts of powers. No, when I started doing the calculations, it's really about 1.25 watts of power is the absolute maximum that I would be able to produce, and that greatly can, you know changes how much I can do and when I can do it um, and things like that. There's a lot of other constraints uh, in here, but if you look very, 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 very closely at the bottom, you'll see security. Um, and it's very small. And the reason why is that historically security has not been a uh, forefront. Now, there are obviously exceptions to that rule governments uh you know defense contractors and stuff reconnaissance satellites weapons potential weapon system hypothetically uh one of the things i learned is that in order to put something in space you do have to go through like itar certification which is a international uh, tra uh arms trade um because basically every satellite is classified as a weapon um which was just kind of interesting uh to me um but security has just not necessarily been a big thing. Um, security from a physical perspective of protecting the ground station stuff has definitely been, uh, as well as cybersecurity. But as far as securing some of the platforms actually operating in space, um, it's just been a little bit uh, lacking. But we're we're getting there, um, and we're seeing a kind of a revolution happening. And part of that revolution that's happening is because of this term called the democratization of space. Um, and fundamentally what this re refers to is this is the a transition period of space exploration utilization from being solely based in the domain of national governments and their respective space agencies to it's now being accessible to a broader range of, uh, of peoples, whether it's universities, uh, research organizations, commercial entities as a whole, and even in some cases, just individuals. Um, this transition has allowed more uh, people to kind of get into space and participate in space ac space activities. Um, and so as we see more and more players into the space industry, what we're also seeing is kind of the ramifications of that um, as far as like, hey, what used to be security through our obscurity and things like that, now things are becoming a lot more accessible. And this democratization of space has happened for a couple of, uh, actually a bunch of different reasons, but um, the first big one um, is just the, the decrease in launch cost. Um, as technology has improved, as um, uh, things like, we'll use SpaceX, for example, uh, with the cadence that SpaceX launches their Falcon 9, uh, it used to be that we may have maybe um, uh, within the United States, one or two, four launches a year and stuff. I feel like SpaceX launches about five times a week. It's not quite that much, but um, as and by being able to launch more frequently through the technologically techno, technological advantages of being able to reuse rockets and things like that, the cost has dropped considerably uh, just to be able to launch uh, a satellite into space. Um, also, we have seen the proliferation proliferation of smaller satellites historically you would have what i would call monolithic satellites they would be these massive sometimes multi-ton um apparatuses that would have a bunch of different uh payloads and stuff like that they'd be inordinarily expensive you know hundreds of million dollars to develop and launch um we have seen in the last 20 years that a lot of satellites are getting smaller they are uh becoming um, more single uh, mission focused, and um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. But uh, I really would equate them to Docker containers in space. Um, if you want to think of like you know a, a physical server, 
uh, this, you know, big thing, hard drives, all the bells and whistles and stuff to run your, your application and stuff. And then, and then we went to virtual machines and, and now we have containers and stuff. That's really kind of where, um, space is going. It's like you have a single mission objective. You have a single thing that you're testing, especially from a scientific and research perspective. Um, as you'll see, we've also seen um, regular policy and regulations have have, uh, have kind of made it more possible. We're, we're seeing um, guidance and regulatory frameworks for commercialization of space uh, that are that are allowing people to, to be able to enter this game where it just wasn't possible uh, previously. You know, this is all really happening in, in the last 20 years. So one of my focuses has primarily been low earth orbit so here we have an image of some uh, of the predominant uh um, orbits uh leo standing for low earth orbit uh, you'll see some variations on what where leo starts and ends and stuff but it's generally uh, between uh about 400 kilometers and upwards of 2000 kilometers is will be considered low earth orbit uh does anybody know where space technically starts um there, there's actually a, a definition uh, for that. You throw it into um, uh, into Discord or whatever. Um, I'll give it a second and I'll come back to it. Um, but you have uh, Mio, which is like a, a Middle Earth orbit, which is really disappointing that you can't launch a satellite into Mio and then all of a sudden be in Tolkien's world. Little bit, a uh, little bit disappointed there. But um, uh, let's see, eighty kilometers up, thirteen miles up. No, so the 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 real kind of general definition that is uh, taken is going to be the Carmen line, which is a, at 60, uh, 62 miles up or 100 kilometers is going to be technically uh, the beginning of space. Um, and so my focus has been on low earth orbit for a couple of reasons. Um, it is the, uh, it is the lowest of the, the stable orbits that you can get into, which means that we have shorter communication latencies. We also don't have to have as much, uh, transmission power, uh, both, uh, on the ground station side, as well as, uh, on the spacecraft side, um, because we're just not traversing, um, uh, uh, great, tremendous distances and things like that. Um, also, it is the cheapest, uh, most cost-effective uh, orbit to get into from from a launch perspective. In fact, if you want to go to more those higher orbits, uh, such as uh, geostationary or MEO um, or the the HEO, which will be um, uh, higher the orbit or highly elliptical orbits, is, is really a better uh, explanation of that. Uh, most of the time, you have to start and uh, get into a low Earth orbit, uh, orbit, and then uh, perform a transfer uh, into the higher orbits and stuff. So if this is the, 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 the first kind of entry orbit, this is where a lot of the stuff is going to happen. Also, low Earth orbit allows for um, better scientific data in terms of Earth observation, whether it's high resolution imagery or uh, atmospheric data, uh, air uh, particulates and things like that, uh, looking at things that like radar sensors and stuff like that. Um, they just operate uh, more effectively in low Earth orbit because you don't have to use as much power. Um, you're able to actually get higher resolution on your data and things. Um, also, you can have, like, it's just easier to get to in general um, so that uh, you have, uh, in LEO, faster orbital windows, like I said, approximately 90 minutes, uh, depending on your actual orientation or uh, altitude. Um for a low Earth orbit, which means you can have a lot of passes uh, over your ground station, over just covering large uh, portions of the Earth very rapidly compared to uh, some of your higher orbits or even ge geostationary where you may not, you're, you're literally locked into a specific position within the Earth's rotation. Um, so that's definitely an advantage uh, from a scientific standpoint. Also, uh, easier end of use or end of life disposal. Um, uh, satellites in low Earth orbit uh, can ease, uh, much much easier be uh, deorbited so that they burn up in the atmosphere and don't contribute to the ongoing space debris. Mm -hmm. um, and the other reason, big reason for um, uh, focusing kind of on low Earth orbit is it's where a lot of the technological advancements are taking place. Things are being tested in LEO before going to 
uh, higher orbits or even potentially deep space uh, deployments and things like that. From an operational standpoint, uh, something that we really don't take into consideration here because we operate within the atmosphere, but low Earth orbit also has a reduced radiation exposure, uh, which means that uh, your hardware is going to be less likely to be impacted by ionizing radiation. Uh, in the form of uh, what one of my mentors uh, coined uh, the Einstein denial of service. Um, and that's just, you know, uh, solar ejections from the from the sun causing bit flips and, and memory and things like that. Um, it's, it's not uh, completely eliminated in low Earth orbit, but it is greatly reduced. And so that also allows us to fly less technologically advanced um, stuff such as Raspberry Pis that don't have uh, any kind of uh, radiation protection and things like that. And we'll get into that too. And they're just typically shorter missions in low Earth orbit as well. Um, in my opinion, the biggest, 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 biggest factor of the democratization of space has been around the CubeSats. Uh, if you're not familiar with CubeSats, uh, this is definitely where I've been playing in my research and my development. Um, the, uh, I think it was 1999, a standard was put out by the University of California Polytechnica, I believe, um, basically setting this standard of what a CubeSat is. It's basically to find a unit of, it's a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube, hence CubeSat, uh, weighing less than 1.33 kilograms. There are, um, uh, you can have multiple cubes, uh, multiple units. If you want to think about it, like a rack unit in a server rack, uh, where you would have a one U server, a two U, a three U, or four U. The same thing exists for CubeSats. You can have a one U CubeSat, a two U, a uh, three, six. Uh, I think the largest that's technically been deployed is a twelve, but I may be wrong on that. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen, these are one U CubeSats. They are they are uh, classified as Pico satellites um, in terms of the the size because they're extremely small. But the advantage of these satellites are, uh, one, they are much more cost effective produced. Now, cost is relative, you know, when we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars to maybe a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand um, dollars. They uh, typically can take advantage of just lower cost uh, hardware in, in general. Um, but they also have the advantages of they're extremely lightweight comparative, and they can fit in really small spaces. Um, and so one of the things that has happened with uh, CubeSat specifically is this idea of ride shares, or we'll, I'm calling it Uber in space. But when, uh, let's say SpaceX, uh, there's also a company called Rocket Labs that just does, uh, focuses on CubeSat launches. Um, when you have a monolithic, a big satellite, let's say you've got a um, uh, 2000 ton capacity uh, in a payload and you've got it, you're sending up a satellite that's only fi uh, 1500 tons. Uh, well, you've got about five, 500 tons of capacity that you could do uh, on a given rocket launch. Well, what they've been able to do is start packing these uh, little CubeSats in and launch them as a rideshare program. So instead of uh, one organization uh, having to fund the entire launch of their satellite, they're able to effectively sublease it out um, and this allows for especially universities, research institutions and stuff. You can just piggyback on an existing ride. Now you still have to, to pay launch cost and, and things like that. But this makes it a lot more accessible because now uh, you have more opportunities to launch instead of just like, yeah, we'll get to your launch windows in seven years. Uh, you could potentially hit a launch window um, in a year or two depending on what the capacities and stuff. So that has definitely helped uh, a lot. And, and CubeSats and, and small Pico satellites, they're very much focused on uh, single mission uh, kind of objectives, uh, testing out a new technology or things like that. They're cheap to produce. They're cheap to launch relative, understand. I, I kind of want to ask John Strand for like $170,000 so we could put one in this space, but I don't think he's going to approve that budget. Um, but it would be fun. Uh, assuming that it actually successfully got off the launch pad, successfully deployed, and didn't uh, like have a catastrophic failure uh, on deployment, all those things considered. Um, but the CubeSats has definitely uh, kind of changed the game in terms of uh, being able to access space and stuff. But as more and more people come into space, there's there's issues that we have to look at, especially from a cybersecurity perspective. 
Um, so this was, this was fun. Um, uh, black hat this year. I don't know if anybody got to attend. I didn't get to attend myself, uh, but I was really anxious to read up and, uh, kind of understand this, uh, presentation by a individual named Johannes Vilbold, a PhD student out of Germany. Um, he effectively, uh, decided that he was going to research the security of CubeSats. Um, and he acquired, uh, physical hardware, uh, from a couple of organizations, including the European Space Agency. Um, and started testing them out and fundamentally found tremendous number of flaws um, in this in these platforms, being able to update the firmware over the air uh, without you know any kind of authentication or anything like that. It got it, it was it was pretty bad. I encourage you if you if you can go and find the, the information uh, on his presentation, check that out. But the thing that I took away from the this article here was this this synopsis that just kind of justified everything when I was doing his highlight here. It says the problem he opined was that space science is such a rarefied field that developers just don't, didn't have the security skills to do a rigorous shakedown in a satellite in the first place. Um, and that's fundamentally the problem is that uh, for, for the longest time, they haven't had to do this. The constraints that they're operating with, the, the being able to squeak out the absolute you know, nano amp of power, the condense everything down into the fewest bytes of data that can be transmitted, uh, accounting for just every effectively one and, and zero in the entire platform has made it very difficult um, to to kind of take a step back, develop the cybersecurity skills and look at it from that perspective. And so maybe there's a way that we can start doing that as, as cybersecurity security professionals kind of making that transition into uh, looking at the space system and stuff. It's not easy. It's not trivial, um, but it's definitely something that the, the general consensus is we, we need more uh, cybersecurity in space. If you look at the frameworks that are coming out, if you look at the guidance that are being given to corporations and entities, this is, this is a, a, uh, a call to arms kind of moment. But we're going to look at some of the actual cybersecurity attacks, ramifications, and the threats um, that you might see in a traditional um, uh, space system. So we're going to start with the ground station. The ground station has is the most sensitive uh, are, uh, let me rephrase that, the most, has the greatest potential for impact in terms of security. Um, the, the attacks that can take place on a ground station uh, uh, system uh, can be from a physical attack, like actually like going in to a facility uh, and, and, and taking it over, um, direct network attacks. These things are attached to the internet. Um, uh, for for you that know of uh, Bo and and Steve's recent work with uh, Graph Runner and stuff, and I think we're doing a, a presentation, a webcast on that next week. Um, uh, Azure, AWS, or Amazon, and GCP all offer what's called Ground Station as a service. Um, and it is you get to utilize their uh, antenna infrastructure, and you just literally plug in your Ground uh, Station software. All of the cloud-based attacks, identity uh, and access management issues and stuff, now those are getting bolted on, on top of the just the general uh, ground station control uh, capabilities and stuff. And so now we're talking a whole new level, attacking this, attacking space by attacking the cloud um, is kind of cool. So software vulnerabilities, jamming of signals is obviously one, um, being able to protect the ground, the ground station, um, uh, the, the operators, uh, the systems, the networks, and and the actual uh, RF equipment or optical equipment is, is very, very important there. Um, and that's, this is where a lot of the threats actually exist, but it's not the sole place. Comlink threats, um, uplink, downlink jamming. We have seen this historically take place um, in different scenarios. Uh, uh, spoofing attacks has, have been able to take replay attacks are also possible. Weak or new and new, bleh. No encryption, and in parentheses we fall back. This was one of the biggest assumptions I made. Everything's encrypted, right? Nope. And the reason that everything's not encrypted are for various reasons. One, they just didn't think it was necessary. Two, the technical uh, uh, limitations of the spacecraft and the orbit and things may not made it uh, exactly feasible because uh, if you're in a higher orbit, 
you're going to be exposed to a lot more radiation. You run the risk of having your encryption keys corrupted uh, by um, uh, ionizing radiation. Um, and so you may not bake encryption in at all, or you may have to fall back to open comms to reestablish um, communication stuff. And you better hope when you fall back to open comms that your satellite is running in a state that it pri primarily can only reestablish encrypted comms. You don't want it to be fully exposed. But these are some of the threats that ha uh, happen. Um, uh, also, jamming the signals, I, I like the feedback for the, the jam uh, that's... I thought it was funny, um, but also if you're using optical based uh, communications, uh, weather can be a, can be an issue as experienced uh, or um, kind of documented by NASA with its recent uh, deep space laser communication uh, trials that it's been running. Spacecraft threats and challenges, space debris, it is a massive problem. We've got a bunch of junk flying up there. Um, that will absolutely destroy your spacecraft. And there's not a lot you can do about it, um, especially if you're uh, working with CubeSats that have limited propulsion capabilities. Um, you, your satellite may crash into another satellite, creating double the debris. Um, these are just things that we have, you know, a little, a little bit, oh, um, uh, we have to be aware of, but uh, depending on your control systems, the size of your satellites, your power constraints, you, you may not be able to avoid space debris at all. Uh, resource-based constrained abuse. This is not resource-based con uh, constrained delegation, uh, red teamers. Sorry about that. But this is effectively what I mentioned earlier about like being able to abuse a resource to the point that it creates a denial of service condition. An example, in the CubeSats that I built, uh, you could put a command in a, uh, in a loop, in a while loop, sending it up that would cause the satellite to continuously uh, try to transmit data um, at a power usage of over 100 milliamps higher than its its receive mode, um, which would drain the batteries. And if we were operating in uh, in in space or something like that, it would uh, overpower its ability to recharge. And then the the satellite would essentially go into a deep sleep state until the batteries recharged. And you could potentially keep doing this over and over again. Um, also, software vulnerabilities, guys, uh, if you're working on, on the secure software side, software development side, the bugs in space are much more impactful than the bugs here uh, on terrestrial systems um, because you don't have the opportunity to fix them in most cases. Uh, I was talking uh, in the pre-pre-show banter with some people um, that unless your satellite is designed to be patched from the beginning, you probably don't have the ability to patch it. You may not have a, enough memory um, because what we have to do is uh, you'd have to be able to upload the patch and, and store that somewhere. And then you're going to have to have enough memory to be able to apply that patch. You're also going to have to have a process for being able to roll back if that patch wasn't successful. It's a lot, it's, you know, the same kind of issues that we uh, deal with here um, in our patch management process and stuff. It's just magnified. Um, tremendously in space. Uh, kinetic weapons, um, anti-satellite -sat weapons um, are a thing um, that you have that we ha have to take into to considerations, but also as mentioned previously, the environmental stuff, radiation, temperature, gravity, uh, low Earth orbit, uh, CubeSats that don't have um, uh, propulsion capabilities and stuff, you're going to deorbit uh, naturally. Um, and it's a matter of can you execute your mission before that happens. Um, also, the lack of redundancy in some cases um, is a huge challenge. What I mean by redundancy is um, going back to like the encryption conversation stuff, like one solution that you can to, uh, implement potentially is store your uh, encryption keys on different sides of the spacecraft. Um, so, and, and being able to have a, a, a check. And so um, I know there's a, a company uh, called uh, Kratos Defense that is doing a lot around software defined um, satellites and it's with a built-in redundancy capability. A lot of, com um, of your more, uh, capable spacecraft and satellites are using redundant FPGAs, uh, field, pro field programmable gate arrays, uh, so that if, if something goes wrong on one subsystem that they can switch over and stuff. Another significant, significant issue is going to be supply chain issues. As uh, Johannes Vilbold uh, kind of highlighted, if, you're, if you acquire the hardware from the ESA that he was able to do, which is a, essentially a test platform that you bolt on your stuff and then send up into space, you're at the mercy of their designs. Um, 
and any vulnerabilities that are impacted by one uh, of those platforms, every platform that is running that is going to be affected. Um, and so in the same way, software supply chain is not going to be as uh, a big of a problem as much as it is going to be hardware physical. Um, you know, the firmwares within in those hardware platforms definitely could, could be problematic. So that's just a little bit of the, the threats and uh, uh, and stuff that we face. But as as cybersecurity professionals, kind of what can we do? How can we uh, look at this? So uh, quickly, uh, we're going to look at some of the, there are multiple frameworks for being able to assess the security of a space system. Um, in the same way, if you're familiar with MITRE ATT&CK framework, well, MITRE ATT&CK framework is actually used uh, to be able to manage or um, assess the uh, kind of uh, TTPs and tactics and, and things like that for space. But there's also a few others. Uh, one of them is SPARTA. Uh, that is put out by the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, TREX um, is one that's uh, put out by uh, J Jacob Oakley, and I'll talk about uh, him in just a moment. And then you also have Space Shield, which is uh, the European Space Agency is kind of equivalent to both Sparta and uh, the minor attack framework. Uh, this is um, Trex here by J Jacob Oakley. It's it's uh, it's a little bit simpler. It's a it's a newer framework, um, but it, it to me it's very uh, very very concise. Um, jumping over here is Space Shield by the ESA. It looks very much like uh, the minor attack framework. Maybe because it was based off the minor attack framework. I don't know. And then Sparta by the Aerospace Corporation. These are all uh, frameworks that uh, you can use. They're still developing in some of their maturity and things like that. But I do want to take uh, a moment to go back to the, the Viasat attack that we talked about uh, at the eve of the Ukrainian conflict. A, uh, a, a gentleman uh, named Francois um, actually recently, just a, a few, like, 16 days ago, released this analysis of the Viasat um, attack and uh, using the minor attack framework. Um, and was just basically able to outline kind of the TTPs using the attack navigator that uh, to complete the the uh, attack chain. Um, as And you can see what what it kind of looked like there. Uh, there's a link in the in the slides if you want to actually go and read that. I would highly encourage you to read that if you're just interested. I think I think it was fantastic analysis. And the Viasat hack is is one that it it kind of opened everybody's eyes um, to uh, like this is something that we really we we got to get a handle on. Um, I found it was interesting that they actually uploaded uh, the threat actors a uh, modified version of Wiper uh, specifically to run on the satellite hardware, which I don't know how long Wiper's been around, um, but the fact that it's hey we got a new version specifically targeting satellites that's kind of cool. Um, also, uh, there are tremendous amounts of um, uh, guidance and frameworks and things like that from organizations. One organization that if you go too, too much further into this you'll, is the CCSDS, which is the uh, Consultative Community for Data Space Systems. They define a lot of stuff. Um, uh, they they have an entire uh, space packet protocol for being able to, you know, kind of con consistently unify data structures and things like that. NIST has a lot of uh, uh, publications, um, interagency reports and things regarding satellite ground segment security, uh, the introduction to uh, cybersecurity for commercial satellite operations. There is a lot of stuff. Um, the best really place you can start is the aerospace corporation um and look at all of their publications and things on uh cybersecurity. but now we're going to talk about the future the future of cybersecurity in space i don't know it's going to depend on us it's going to depend on us as cybersecurity professionals it's going to depend on the space industry it's going to depend on regulations and 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 policies and things like that um, it's we we we're going to have to step up to the plate. We're going to have to start bringing uh, some of our toolkits and our capabilities and our knowledge to the table. Um, if you if you want to look at it, network security, application security, IoT, uh, ICS, SCADA, uh, APIs, embedded hardware, um, wireless, RF, 
all of those specialties that we have in this industry, they exist on a, on a singular space platform. Um, and so we can bring our uh, skill sets and our knowledge and, and try to help kind of drive this uh, future for a more secure space. And it's, it's going to happen um, eventually, but, you know, can we, can we accelerate that and stuff? But so how do you, how do you kind of get started? And this was the, the struggle that I had was like, where do you start? Um, so here's just a few references or, or resources, uh, projects that you may want to be aware of. One of them is Satnogs. Satnogs is a fantastic uh, global community of amateur gra- ground station, gra- amateur and professional ground stations that monitor uh, for satellite communications. Um, it, it's a platform that can be used by uh, universities and stuff for being able to receive their data. OpenSat Kit is a software uh, kit that you can actually deploy virtual satellites uh, using uh, virtual machines and Docker containers. Um, uh, core flight system. It is a open source flight software solution uh, by NASA. They also have another one called F prime learning curve is pretty high on that. Um, but it's definitely something you can check out. If you want to go a little more simpler, tiny GS uh, it's using Laura based communications. Um, it's just a simple $50 ground station that you can set up and receive data from uh uh, satellites that are operating within the lower spectrum, um, depending on either uh, 433 megahertz, I believe, 915 megahertz, and um, uh, something like that. Also, OpenC3 uh, Cosmos, uh, that is a open source ground control software. I've been working heavily with it uh, in my development stuff. The documentation for those guys are just absolutely uh, primo. Um, another one is the NASA Operational Simulator for Small Satellites, uh, NOS-3. Um, NOS-3 OpenSat kit are a little outdated, in my opinion. Um, uh, some of the some of the technologies they're using, older version of Co- Cosmos that was produced by Ball Aerospace uh, originally. Um, but it is enough to get you started. If you can run a virtual machine, if you can run a Docker container, you can actually start playing with some of these space technologies. And we're almost out of time, so I'm going to run fly this. Um, how accessible is space and stuff? Well, hardware that you may have within arm's reach has flown in space. Uh, in 2022, uh, the gas packs uh, uh, group out of the Utah State University successfully flew a Raspberry Pi uh, Zero as its onboard computer. Uh, the mission lasted 117 days. The primary mission was successful. If you look in the lower, the bottom image, what they did, their mission was they were testing a passive attitude uh, control system using an aero boom, which was basically like a giant windsock um, uh, filled with a little bit of air. It was able to destable or detumble the uh, CubeSat as the only form of propulsion on that. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. Here's a picture of what that CubeSat looked like uh, prior to launch. Um, it did s- suffer a couple of um, issues, including it lost uh, power on the y, mon- uh, y negative channel, uh, uh, re- reducing its uh, ability to maintain power. Uh, and then later it lost the Z, Z negative channel as well. And eventually it, de- it decayed enough to burn up in the atmosphere. May 2nd or May 22nd. Um, lastly, some quick resources. Uh, I mentioned Jacob Oakley. He has a book called Cybersecurity for Space. Buy it. It's cheap. It's like 30 bucks. It's fantastic. It's only about 160 pages. He does, in my opinion, one of the best jobs of, I don't want to say dumbing down because it's it's not space for dummies. It is putting it into terms that mere mortals can understand and and understand where the the threats and the risk and, and the things like that. Um, also, one of my dear friends, uh, Paul Coggin, has a presentation called Pwned in Space. Um, you can find that. I would definitely look that. He goes through some more of the, the actual history of uh, satellite hacks, successful hacks, documented hacks, and stuff like that. If you really, really, really want to ramp up fast, Look at check out the Aerospace Village, the Hackasat competition um, this year uh, in conjunction with the DoD. They actually launched a 3U CubeSat called Moonlighter for the whole purpose of running a CTF in space. That competition was ran at DEF CON this year. It was hugely successful. Um, absolutely amazing effort. So check out the Aerospace Village. Check, it, check out the Hackasat program. And lastly, we're going to reiterate. Space science is such a rarefied field that developers just didn't have the cybersecurity skills to do a rigorous shakedown of a satellite in the first place. Maybe we can help. 
And that is all I got with one minute to spare. Woo. Good job. Well done, Tim. Uh, good, good job. Uh, also, to everyone in Discord interacting with each other, thank you so much. Uh, the memes were fun. The gifts were fun. The uh, camaraderie was fun. And we appreciate that. Uh, over inside the Q&A, we'll see if there's any questions that were not answered. So here's the thing. Uh, if you feel like your question was not answered, ask it again. Because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes the question gets answered and I can't quite tell if it was answered because I can't quite tell all the things I just learned. So if you have a question that didn't get asked or answered, uh, ask it again. Tim, well done. Uh, I will give you one chance to do like any last thoughts. Like now that you have, we'll do last thoughts and then we'll yeah. do like, five, um, 10 minutes of post-show banter. So the last thoughts, if this is something that you're interested in um, and curious and stuff, I would say um, stay tuned. Um, I, I, I was, I was managed, managed to build a satellite hacking lab for Wild West Hacking Fest. Uh, I learned a lot through that experience. And, um, what I learned is that it's really difficult to, um, kind of introduce these concepts, uh, in a very short window of time, um, and things like that. So I'm going to be releasing, uh, documentation in the coming weeks on how I built the CubeSats, what I've learned and stuff like that. But there's also kind of a future plan, uh, where you will be able to play along and kind of develop this. If you guys are really interested in this, I am toying with the idea of not one, but two anti-siphon courses, uh, around cybersecurity in space, spacecraft security, uh, one from a uh, more generalistic pr perspective and the other one would actually go hands-on hardware. Um, so if that's something that you guys would be interested in, let us know. Um, because this is, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for six months and I have a three month road, a three year roadmap for where I want to go with this research. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on this Black Hills Information Security webcast. Uh, I am Jason Blanchard, and all of us here at the team, thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Uh, our whole goal is to help make you better at what you do, uh, to help you get better employment, better, do better at your organization, and just be all around better. The one thing that we always say internally is that we want the best defenders we can possibly have. Because when we go up against you as a penetration tester or a red teamer, we want you to fight back just as hard as we are. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us and improving yourself and your organization today by learning this. And with that, that is the, that is the end of the, uh, web, the official webcast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have, there's a question from our good buddy, Jerry. Yeah. Um, is the risk of something like Log4j Voln and a satellite irrelevant because there's basically no security on the SATs anyway? Um, so... Uh, I mean, to say there's no risk, uh, I, I, it would be a little hard to assess. Um, the likelihood of some of like Log4j um, actually being present on a satellite is probably not high. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I know Microsoft has plans to put a data center in space. Um, now, which is like a moon, like an orbiting data center. So uh, at that point, anything's pretty much possible. Um, uh, more of the risk is going to be around like embedded software and things like that. You, I mean, there are uh, things like Docker, Kubernetes. Those are all uh, technologies that are actively flying in orbit right now. So vulnerabilities impacting those ecosystems very much uh, would introduce a risk to the uh, to the spacecraft and to the mission and things like that. Now, getting access to them and stuff, hopefully that's very, very difficult. They're enforcing encryption. The ground stations are secure. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is looking at some of the uh, simulating the, the ground station as a service attacks uh, by being able to uh, leverage some of the, the things like uh, what Bo and Steve are doing to get access into cloud environments that could spill over into um, there are multiple multiple vendors that are selling kind of um, these services that are effectively just um, overlays on the existing ground station as a service and stuff. So multiple customers using the same uh, same platforms and stuff could definitely have uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one thing I didn't see in your presentation is physical access to the satellite. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. right. It's expensive. Uh, I mean, so it is definitely a a threat. Um, I don't think it's a very 
realistic threat outside of nation state um, uh, level and stuff. But fundamentally, I think you're more likely to just get shot down. Um, but, um, you know, one of the, the things that, uh, as, uh, Johannes Will, uh, Vilbold's showed the ability to, you know, modify a firmware update over the air that has the same, uh, uh, effect as being able to get physical access to the satellite and potentially modify something. Um, so you kind of have to look at the, the, you know, what is the end goal, uh, of physical access? Well, there's probably a, a, easier more cost effective way than sending somebody up to space navigating to that specific orbit not interfering with it because you're probably going to be pretty well detected mm-hmm. I'm, I'm picturing like mission impossible nine where he's in that like centrifuge thing and like gets sent into space and he's like oh. yeah, yeah. Uh, gonna do- what is it uh 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 spend launch uh yeah. is the company that's actually uh uh uh, testing out a, a launch apparatus uh, um, very much like the uh, uh, flight trainers and stuff, centrifugal uh, accelerators that, that are used. Uh, very cool, very cool technology. Yeah, uh, real quick announcement for the 306 of you here. We have a summit coming up in December. So if you want to join us for the free summit that we're doing through anti-siphon training, and you're like, how is Black Coast related to anti-siphon? And while was hacking fast? Well, it's all John Strand. We're all uh, John It's all John Strand. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you want, join us at the summit. We'll drop a link into the um, into the Zoom chat. And then I do want to remind you that next week, Bo's coming here to talk about Graph Runner. And as far as an offensive tool, Graph Runner is... Mm. holy cow it's hard it is defender mm. we're releasing it so that you understand what the attackers are capable of it is very important for you to learn about graph runner because it is going to be used in the it's, future he's so cryptic <laughs> but not you're pretty pretty blunt i guess yeah, yeah. now so be here defenders, learn graph runner off yeah. offenders learn graph learn, runner. yeah <laughs> All right. and hands down the most the most like kind of game changing uh process and technique that I've seen in a while. It's it's so unfair. <laughs> and so we're gonna level the playing field. <laughs> yeah. So what we do here. Yeah. Uh when Bo is like explaining it to me, he's like, and then I found this, and then I found this, and I found this. And I was like, what? Yeah. And and I like I said, I had the conversation with Steve just yesterday about layering those techniques uh and and on top of like the fact that there are capabilities to integrate into space systems from these cloud infrastructure it's like you know i'm not sure anybody has is really looking at it from that perspective because now you're you know all everything that we're concerned about from an organization standpoint we're now having to take concern from our space system as well because everything's becoming highly integrated um and why build a massive ground station when you can rely on on those that are available to you and you just pay ten dollars a minute for it uh and so the name of the tool is graph runner graph Graph. Runner. and we'll drop the link into zoom if we can real quick before we go uh, mm-hmm. before we leave so i'm going to drop the link into the zoom chat so that way you all have access to it uh, join us at the Snake Oil Summit, but definitely if you are if you haven't heard of Graph Runner yet, click that link inside Zoom. Not a fish. Learn about Graph Runner. When we got this blog from them, it was like forty six pages long. It was screenshots and details and like it is in depth. This is important. This is important. Please learn it. So, mm. All right, mm. we'll we'll learn about it with you next week. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, Tim, I think that's it. If you ever need a red team, pen test, thread hunt, uh, if you need just to talk to people about security, uh, we're here for you. Uh, We want to help you get better so that the industry gets better and so that organizations get better because the attackers are getting better. And we want to make sure that we uh, stay at least uh, (laughs) capable as they are uh, or more. That's, I didn't want that to be like, yeah, I didn't want it to be like fear and uncertainty and doubt. Like, I just like, you're here because you want to get better. Yes. Thank you so much for doing that. Yes. Right. Yeah, you can leave it at that. All right. Ryan, kill oh. it. Kill it with Ryan. Kill it. Kill, kill with Ryan.